Welcome, Mountaineer Nation. Backyard Brawl Weeks continues today with Phil Friday. Phil Steele has been joining us since the regular season began. That's going to continue over the course of the rest of the regular season. And it's been so successful, we wanted to give Phil a much wider berth. So we're going to give him a time slot that will include all day today, every day Friday for Phil Friday. So we wanted to welcome you aboard for episode 86 of ITG as we continue with a lot of action this week. Uh, but let's start with this. This episode of ITG is going to be brought to you by Bet Online. It's your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use promo code BLEAV, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online for the game starts. And speaking of the game starting, one thing I wanted to recap before Skyler joins me to welcome in the uh, star of the show, Phil Steele. Uh, I wanted to recap some of the picks that Skyler and I had some fun with last week in West Virginia's win over Towson. What we're going to try and do in these Phil Friday episodes is kind of do our own handicapping and come up with some fun in-game bets that we have with each other uh, to see who can fare better. So last week, we went over under 52 points for West Virginia against Duquesne. And we based that on the fact that Neil Brown's uh, average against FCS competition at West Virginia had been 51 and a half points. Skyler and I both took the over, and of course we hit that in West Virginia's 56 to 17 win. Uh, and then we took uh, the total passing yards. We said Garrett Green over under 173 and a half. That was based on the fact that last year JT Daniels in West Virginia's FCS game against Towson had 174. So Garrett Green over under 173 and a half passing yards. Both of us took the under. And, of course, Garrett exceeded that, so we missed out on that. And then, finally, West Virginia had, in its previous three FCS games in the previous three years, had one takeaway. We forced one turnover in each of those three games. So the over-under in this case was over-under one-and-a-half takeaways for West Virginia. Skyler against Duquesne took the under. I took the over. And the Avery Wilcox interception toward the end of the game actually gave the Mountaineers their second takeaway. So, that hit the over. Uh, now, what I do want to do is remind everyone that uh, this episode is also brought to you in part by our friends at Toothman Ford. We all know that cars cost less than Grafton. I can't say enough about uh, our friend J.R. Toothman and the things that he does, not just for West Virginia University student athletes, but also for the community at large. It's just that that business and that guy, uh, uh, great folks down there. So their, their association affiliation with the West Virginia Hospital uh, so if you're looking for a newer used vehicle, make sure that that's the first place you stop and you check. Cars cost less and less in Grafton. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk us to a break, and then uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Phil Steele in with uh, Skyler. And one of the things I'm most eager to hear is Phil has this computer in which he feeds all his analytics and all his data, and the, the computer shoots out, I should say, score projection. So I'm really eager to hear what kind of score projection it might shoot out to see for the backyard brawl. So that's one of many things we're going to discuss with Phil, including the top 25, other action around the Big 12. So when we return after this break, we will be joined by the star of the show, Phil Steele, and Skylar Callahan will be uh, in here as well. So right after the break, stay tuned. Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guarantee to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, where cars cost less. In Grafton and at ToothmanFord.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In the Gun Podcast. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. 
Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Let's go, Mountaineer fans. You're tuned in to In the Gun with Wes, the runaway beer truck, and the signal caller. All right, we are back with college football's best, Phil Steele. Again, if you haven't yet got your uh, your magazine from uh, Phil Steele, you can get that at Books A Million, Barnes & Noble. Still very worth uh, the knowledge that you can take in throughout the week leading up to every single weekday. So, uh, Phil... Glad to have you back on, my guy. And uh, are you ready to dive in some of some games here? You betcha. All right. Phil, so let's let's start with this. And Skylar, you can jump into the games. Last yeah. week, your score prediction for West Virginia, the score might have been slightly off, but you had the Mountaineers by thirty nine points. West Virginia fifty six seventeen. Let me see my my math's right. That's the Mountaineers by thirty nine points. And then the Utah Baylor game, it's like you were there. I mean, everybody in the country is telling us, oh, Baylor's struggling. They're not going to show up. They're going to get their doors blown off. And Phil Steele said, not so fast, my friend. Baylor's going to play tough. And Utah's going to barely escape late. So, anyway, I had to give credit where credit's due. But, Skyler, let's go. Yeah, so maybe uh, keep an eye on that West Virginia prediction later on in the show from Phil and see uh, if, if he's right there. So, if he picks the Mountaineers, we know we, we might be in good shape. So, let's start off with some top 25 action. It's Minnesota – at North Carolina and Phil, I mean, it seems like every time North Carolina gets together with App State, always something crazy happens. So I don't know how much you can take away from that other than App State's just a tough, grimy football team and, and North Carolina found a way to win. This is kind of a, an op- a great opportunity here for them to get to 3-0. and Do they do so? Yeah, I do think they get to 3-0. and I don't think it'll be easy. Uh, I think Minnesota will give them a game when you look at the Gophers. Uh, they play real good defense. Joe Rossi, one of the better defense coordinators out there. They're allowing just 224 yards per game. Granted, they haven't taken on uh, Drake May yet, but uh, they will here. Uh, but this is a, a Minnesota team that plays well. It's an away dog. Uh, I, I think that they'll give North Carolina a test. But overall, North Carolina is the better team. Offensively, a large edge there. I love the way you know, Marion Hampton running the football, 271 yards. 6.5 yards per carry, and Drake May didn't have any touchdown passes last week. I expect that to change this week. I see North Carolina winning this one something like 7 to 10 points. Should be a good game to watch, though. Kind of a lean top 25 slate this week, Phil, and uh, let's let's jump into the SEC. You got Tennessee standing at 2-0, and uh, pitted against Florida. Florida had a get-right game against McNeese after the loss to Utah. Uh, Tennessee, it's really the first true test for Joe Milton. How do you see this shaking out with the Gators and the Volunteers? Yeah, and last week, Tennessee was shaky. They scored a touchdown just before the half. They actually go up 13-6 to against Austin P. Uh, we're not that impressive in that game offensively. In fact, they got out first down uh, 19-17. to I do think Tennessee's the better team talent-wise, uh, but this is a very dangerous Florida team, and you know, let's face it, I think Florida's won like 16 in the last 17 games against Tennessee. Tennessee hasn't won in the Swamp since 2003. That's got to be in their mind here. To, uh, Florida can be a very dangerous home dog in the Swamp. And that game against Utah, if you go back and look at it, you know, they, they actually had a 76-yard edge in the game. They just shot themselves in the foot. I thought Graham Mertz looked good against McNeese. It'll be a much tougher test against Tennessee. I think Florida's got a shot at a possible upset here. I'm going to think I'm going to call for uh, – I like Florida as the home dog. They're getting about a touchdown in this one at home uh, to take this one right down to the wire. Should be another good game, and uh, I'm going to take the home dog in this one. And we'll go to the site of college game day this week, and that's not Morgantown, unfortunately, but it's going to be in Boulder, Colorado, Colorado, Colorado State. 
And I mean, Phil, Shador Sanders, at some point, I think a lot of people are going to start dropping that tag that he's Dion's kid and that he is Shador Sanders because this kid is on fire. Two games and two of games are two, both of those games against power five opponents. And he's thrown for six touchdowns, 903 yards and no picks. I mean, that's unheard of. Yeah, un- unbelievable. And he's got some talent to work with. I mean, like Travis Hunter is playing like 100-plus snaps per game. That's unheard of. And I think they probably uh, rest Travis Hunter a little bit this week. Maybe, I mean, they've got Oregon and USC on deck. They're off two big games. This is a big flat spot, except, as you mentioned, game day is is on hand for this. Now, last week in the first half, they actually punted on their first four possessions. Nebraska's defense played really well. Uh, Nebraska had three turnovers late in the half, which gave them 13 points, but the yardage was dead even at the half, 150 to 144, and then they just lit them up in the second half. I I was disappointed the way Colorado State played in their opening game against Washington State. Got blown out. I thought they were going to give Washington State a game. Uh, I can tell you that Colorado State is pumped up for this game. They're off a bye. All they've been hearing all off season is the talk in the state of Colorado about Colorado, nothing about Colorado State. So I think the situation favors Colorado State, but I'm not going against this Colorado machine until they actually uh, don't don't cover a game. So uh, I lean a little bit with Colorado State, but but nothing major on that one. I I, I mean, Colorado's going to win the game, but they're about about over a 21 point favorite. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into uh, into some Big 12 action. Look at some of these games when uh, you have Kansas State pitted against Missouri Kansas State Phil it, it almost seems like they haven't missed a beat Will Howard's doing what you'd expect from Will Howard but more interesting that the run game DJ Giddens Trayshawn Ward transferred in against lesser competition that's been productive uh through the first couple games and Missouri's sitting there two and zero against lesser competition how do you think this this rivalry game shakes out yeah, Missouri's got a good defense, and you know, you go back and you take a look at last year's uh, final score, forty to twelve. That was sort of a little bit turnover fueled at the end of the game. Kansas State put some scores on, but uh, I do think Kansas State is the better team. And and last week I thought Middle Tennessee was going to give Missouri a, a game, and they did. They almost won that thing outright. Uh, had the ball down by four late in the game, uh, and just didn't score on their last drive. So. As you mentioned, Giddens and Ward have looked great. They've got a veteran offensive line. I mean, all five starters are back. they got Will Howard, uh, and they have an outstanding defense, one that's holding their opponents to 254 yards below their season average. Uh, the spread's very manageable here. They're only about a four-and-a-half-point favorite. I do like Kansas State to go on the road and uh, and get a win, not quite to the level that they did last year, but definitely uh, I'm, I'm thinking double digits. Uh, I like Kansas State in this one. Now, uh, Cincinnati hosting Miami, Ohio. This is kind of a tricky game, I feel. Like, I don't think the Bearcats should have much problems here. But, I mean, you got Oklahoma on deck, and there's an easy path to 3-0 and here, Phil. So, uh, that big win over Pitt last week, you got to be feeling all fat and sassy. So, what does this team got to do to to make sure they don't peek ahead a little bit too much of the schedule and, and maybe trip up here against Miami, Ohio? Yeah, and I think it's a great spot for Miami of Ohio in this one because Cincinnati has dominated them. They've won 16 in a row. So wow. can you really get your team fired up to uh, play your – even though they're their rival, they beat them 16 straight times. They're off a massive win over Pitt, and now they've got Oklahoma on deck. You're talking about a major flat spot, I think, for Cincinnati. Now, I've been impressed with Emory Jones. Emory Jones is a guy who uh, had some starting experience coming in. He was one of the higher-rated quarterbacks out of high school. He's hitting 75%. He's got a 7-1 ratio. Their offense has been rolling under Scott Satterfield in what I thought would be a rebuilding year. They really did surprise me against Pitt last week. But uh, talking to Coach Martin of uh, Miami of Ohio, he's you know normally they mail it in in non-conference play and just focus on MAC games. This is when he sort of wants to stop that streak. It's too many uh, years lost. So I think you're going to see a motivated Miami in this one, catching Cincinnati in a flat spot. I do see Cincinnati winning the game, but I think Miami will keep it closer than expected. Let's jump into, Phil, you talked about Cincinnati being in a situation their transfer quarterback seems to have settled into the saddle pretty seamlessly. Well, not the case necessarily with Keaton Slovis transferring into BYU. They've, they've had this sluggish start, the 14 to nothing hard-fought win in the opener against Sam Houston State. Almost seems like in week two they, they were trying to get some things right in the past game with Keaton Slovis and let him pitch and catch a little more than you'd expect. So uh, 2-0, and but again, two maybe – 
suspect games heading to Arkansas against a defense that's already picked off five passes. How do you see this shaking out? Yeah, and that, I think even though Arkansas is going to be without Rocket Sanders for a second straight week, which really, uh, I mean, that's a, a major blow to them. But I like the way A.J. Green ran the ball last week. He averaged 5.5 yards per carry. As you mentioned, their defense playing pretty well, only giving up uh, 246 yards per game. I was surprised last week that Kent State actually uh, had the yardage edge at the half against them, but I think it was a flat spot for Arkansas, maybe looking ahead to this BYU game. K.J. Jefferson's hitting 74% with a 5-0 ratio. And I was I was nonplussed with Keaton Slovis at Pitt last year, and I've sort of been nonplussed with them so far this year at BYU. So Arkansas's at home. They usually roll teams early in the year. And uh, I, I like the Hogs at home in this one to win it, uh, win it by double digits. So I, I think BYU is going to pick up their first loss of the season. How about this one? TCU at Houston. It's uh, the, the bit first Big 12 game for Houston. And, and really, I can't get a good read on this team, Phil. I mean, week one, they beat a very good UTSA team in a low-scoring game. They forced three turnovers against Frank Harris, and then they turn right back around and give up 400 yards through the air against JT Daniels, the former Mountaineers. So what are we getting with this Houston team? Yeah, and they got outgained by UTSA in the opening game by 83 yards. And then last week, they trailed Rice 28-7 to at the half. Did rally. They got two touchdowns, I think, in the last, what, four minutes to tie that yeah. thing and send it to overtime. But uh, both both efforts, they've been outgained and, uh, and trailed a good portion. Uh, when you look at TCU, they're coming off that loss to Colorado, but they did put up 541 yards in it. Uh, I, I like the Frogs to go on the road and get the win here. Uh, I think when you look at Houston, Holgerson's in a rebuilding year, in my mind, uh, but and probably better, uh, you know, the win over UTSA was surprising. The loss to Rice was surprising. So I, I, I agree with you 100%. You wonder what, what Houston team we're going to see on the field this week. I'm going to go with TCU to get the win in that one. And finally, without further ado, we got to jump right into, uh, I hear there's a tackle football game in Morgantown Saturday night. So <laughs> let's, let's talk about this edition of the Backyard Brawl. It's an interesting matchup. Uh, both teams with a Power 5 opponent, both teams with an FCS opponent. So you have a two-game body of work, sample size to, to watch and judge from. Uh, Pitt coming off of that game against Cincinnati. One thing that we all know, Pat Narduzzi hates is when his defense lets somebody run the football on him. West Virginia last year with 190 yards on the ground. Cincinnati last year with last week with over 200 yards on the ground. I got to think that he's going to come in just bent on not letting West Virginia run the football. So do we have to make some plays in the air? It's an interesting matchup, Phil. Yeah, it is. And I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, prior to last week, uh, I would have had Pitt probably uh, – four to six point favorite in this game. I thought Pitt was the better team, but the two things that really concerned me in that game against Cincinnati, which you hit right on the head, uh, giving up 216 yards on the ground of the Bearcats. And then how about Phil Jerkovic? Uh 10 of 32. That's yeah. a, a really bad. I mean, he was under pressure, took five sacks during the game. So now I have questions about the offensive line. I have questions about Phil Jerkovic. I thought he was going to step in and, and be seamless in Signetti's offense, uh, you know, an offense that he's thrived in in the past. And the pit run defense is an automatic, and it, it didn't show up last week. So all those three things are a major concern. Uh, and when you look at West Virginia, it plays right into their hands. Talking to Neil Brown this year, the strength of this team is the offensive line and the run game. And frankly, you know, Garrett Green's looked a little bit better than expected hitting 58% of the 4-0 ratio so far this year, and, of course, a dangerous runner. And West Virginia's defense after, well, Penn State is a loaded team. They are a legitimate top-five team this year, so losing to them in the opener is not bad. Uh, I like what I saw to the defense last week. So, you know, what I had thought was going to be a pit win last week, now when I uh, go to my computer for it and I said, okay, come on, computer, tell me who's going to win this game and by how much. <laughs> it comes up 29-29 in this game, a pure toss-up. Oh. So, uh yeah, unfortunately, I wanted it to give me a side, and it didn't give me a side in this one. I think it's going to be a great game, uh, and, but I no longer think Pitt is definitely the superior team. I think this is an even battle. So what the heck? Let's go with the home team. I like it. So there you go. Now Phil's got West Virginia. He, he picked them by thirty nine last week. So we, we got to we maybe have some good fortunes here rolling into Morgantown on Saturday night. Uh, Phil, one last thing before we get you out of here. 
I think this is a very crucial game for both of these teams, right? You know, Pitt's won 20 games the last two years, but if they lose this game and head back home one and two, this could this could really start a downslide for them. Like th this is a, a tough schedule that they've got. They got North Carolina coming up, uh, but at, at the same time for West Virginia, if they lose this game, it could it could do mm. the same effect. So, how important do you feel like this game is for both of these teams, and who needs to have this one more? You know, I'm actually going to say West Virginia needs to have this one more because, as you mentioned, they've got Texas Tech at TCU at Houston, a rough schedule coming up with Pitt. You go back to last year. Last year, Pitt opened up the season uh, four and four, uh, you know, which was very disappointing for them. They had not expected to be there. Then they won their last five games, and it turned out to be a pretty good year with that bowl win over UCLA uh, to get to nine and four. I think they can recover. They've got a big ACC game on deck against North Carolina at home. If they lose this game to West Virginia, but beat North Carolina. They can beat Virginia Tech. They can beat Louisville at home. They can beat Wake Forest at home. These are all games they'll be favored in. I think it's probably a little more important for West Virginia this week. Awesome. Well, Phil, thank you so much for uh, coming back on here again this week, and uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Hey, can I throw uh, something out real quick? Uh, yeah. We talked about the, the, the predictions. I do a, a newsletter called Inside the Press Box, and it actually has all 75 games involving FBS teams completely analyzed. My prediction, my computer prediction. If you go to philsteel.com, you can get this week's issue uh, right there at, at philsteel.com for just 20 bucks. Awesome. And uh, if Jed tries to get your, your top passing offense in the Big 12 next week, don't don't tell him we're uh, we're, we're keeping him down to the bottom of our weekly standings. So, <laughs> <laughs> Phil, as always, Sounds we great. appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it, Phil. Hey, a lot of fun. A lot of fun talking football with you, as always, guys. Absolutely. All right. So to wrap up Phil Friday here. Uh, Jed and I, we're going to go through our WVU pit picks and it's our over unders. I got to gain some ground. I can't let Jed get too much confidence in here because then that'll maybe spill into our weekly pick. So for Wes and Owen, I got you guys. I'm going to make sure I bounce back this week. So uh, last week I went one and two, Jed two and one. This is redemption week for me. I'm, uh, I'm going to say this, Scott, let's double back. First of all, who needs a computer? When you got Phil, I'm going to trust <laughs> yeah. Phil over the computer. How about the computer? Phil's computer 29, 29. 29, 29. So heck with that computer. I'm going to trust Phil Steele. Phil Steele yeah. says, heck, let's go with the mountain. Here's the home standing Mountaineers. So yes, sir. Uh, I'm going with them. now for this week's pick scholar. I tried to make it interesting. Again, we're doing our own handicapping here from a pick'em standpoint. Last year, West Virginia, kind of surprised Pitt with C.J. Donaldson, and we ran for 190 yards. Mm -hmm. Different animal this year. Uh, I'm going to peg the number over under at 150 yards. So the question is, West Virginia's run game against Pitt Saturday night over under 150 yards. What say you? I think for West Virginia to win this game, they have no choice but to lean on that run game. I don't think they fly over 150. It may hover around 150, 155, 160, but I think they get there. And again, because we've talked about it before, when you add Garrett Green and his ability to run into the mix, that's an, an extra 20 or 30 yards that you maybe weren't getting in years past. So I'm going to go over, but it, I'm not as confident as I seem right now. So I'm going to say they get over that, that 150 mark. I'm going to say... And again, Garrett is the X factor that really gives you pause here one way or the other. I think it's a pretty easy number without Garrett. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I'm, I was leaning under, but I'm going to say I'm going to lean over. And one of the reasons I'm going to say that is I, I think that I'm hoping for a game in which West Virginia gets some kind of lead. We'll see. Uh, and, and if, in fact, we have to spend part of the second half running the football, uh, that should put us in position to go over 150. So I'm going to go over as well. And looking at the second number, now this is a little outside the box. When you look at how last year's game unfolded, it ended up 38, 31, 69 total points. But most of that scoring came in the second half. It was a defensive battle through the first two quarters. It was tied at 10 at the half in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Last year. So you had 20 points scored total in the first half. And in the second half, you had 49 points scored total. So the question I have for you, Skylar, this year, which half this year will generate more scoring? 
or will it be the same? I, I'm going to say it's going to be the second half again, and that's only because you look at the West Virginia-Penn State game, and I know Penn State's defense is really good and really talented, but they only put up seven points there. It was kind of a slow start after they looked like they actually had a decent start by moving the ball. They just couldn't do anything with it. Duquesne, they come out a little slow, and then the weather delay happens, and all of a sudden they figure everything out, and then you know they, they do what they needed to do against Duquesne. And then for Pitt, I mean, it's it's hard to see them bouncing back out of, from that game against Cincinnati where Dracovic was you know 10 of 32 or whatever he was, and they ran 2.9 yards per, per carry um, against Cincinnati. And, and I think this West Virginia defensive front is much better than advertised. Now, the, the secondary, that's a whole other question. <laughs> but I think this front seven may be a little bit better than maybe even I anticipated it being. Uh, again, we're only two games in, so small sample size. But I, I think it's going to be a slow start for both these teams. As the game unfolds, we're going to start seeing some scoring. So I, I definitely think we're, it's going to be similar to last year. I don't think it's going to be quite as high scoring, but I'm going to say second half is where all the action takes place. You know, I was leaning towards second half as well, but it'd be too boring to to agree. With you. <laughs> so what, what yeah, I'm you got to go first half. Myself. I'm going to try and talk myself. Let me let me create a narrative so I can talk myself into <laughs> most of the scoring being in the first half. I think West Virginia comes out energized. I think the crowd really ignites us. I think we get out to a big start with some big plays, get off to uh, an early jump, and uh, most of the scoring does take place in the first half and things kind of settle in and we slow the pace in the second half. So for the sake of making things interesting, I'll say most of the scoring takes place in the first half. I like it. Maybe yeah, that'll fine. be the difference maker. Finally, we wrap up with this. Now this is tricky for a, a laundry list of reasons. Which quarterback, Garrett Green or Phil Dracovich, oh. go for more yards Saturday night? Which will throw for when, more yards? When you sent me this one, I, I I immediately saw it and was like, "Oh my gosh!" And I and I've been back and forth on this one ever since. I still can't. This is a flip a coin for me. Um, I think when you look at the the odds on ITG Sportsbook, I think they're probably about one ten right now. That <laughs> minus one ten. There's no there's no huge favorites on either way. But I'm gonna go. I'm going to go with Big Phil here, and the only reason I'm doing that is, again, because I think West Virginia's got to run the ball to win this game. And when you look at West Virginia's secondary, there's some major question marks back there. And as you've noted before, you know, Pitt's going to take their shots. So, you know, as you talked about yesterday on the, on the preview show, they, they like to throw the ball downfield. And if they can get behind the secondary – on some of those shots, that could create some big chunk plays, 30, 40 yard gains. I'm going to say Phil Dracovic. Uh, this one I will disagree. <clears throat> and not just because when I blindly drew my weekly pick for most <laughs> cards out of this very. That was great, player, by the way. Uh, it was Garrett Green. It was West Virginia to throw for the most pass shorts in the Big 12. I'm not just saying it to defend that pick out of my hat, uh, <laughs> but I'm looking at it like this. I, I expect Pitt to come in hell-bent on stopping the run. We ran the ball on them last year. Cincinnati ran the ball on them last week. I think that Pat Narduzzi hates getting run on as much as he hates losing. So they might not be yeah, as that's equipped true. to stop the run. I mean, I don't think Pitt's as equipped to stop the run as they've been in the last four years when they've led the ACC and run defense. But I think schematically, he's going to try and compensate for that. And in doing so, he's going to give us some opportunities on the perimeter to make some plays. But the, the, the concern that I would have is what you touched on. Uh, if if Pitt can find a way to max protect and address the protection issues that they encountered against Cincinnati last week and take some of those shots downfield, I, I wonder how West Virginia's back end can hold up if Djurkovic has time to do that. So I, we, we do need to get after him. And that front seven that you talked about does need to apply pressure. It concerns me if he has an opportunity to push the football vertical, what they might be able to do against us. Uh, but again, I expect Pitt to come in absolutely bent on slowing the run game down and not letting us do what we did last year in Pittsburgh and not letting us do what Cincinnati did last year in Pittsburgh. And they're going to try and force our hand and force us to throw it. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm going to stick with Garrett to throw for more yards than Djokovic. And ideally, 
You have Garrett throw for more yards. You have, uh, well, I guess the scoring the first or second half doesn't really matter, but then you also have uh, our other bet there with, uh, what was what was the first one that we did? 150 yeah. yards. The, Here's the, the thing. 150 Scott. yards, yeah. If we break that, uh, if we break that, you're in good shape. I, I think you're breaking. I think you're breaking Pitt's spirit. I really do. Yeah. If you break the 150 on the ground, uh, a lot of other things can fall into place because I think you're breaking their spirit because they're going to come in with a plan, schematically, to throw resources and numbers at at, at the box downhill, uh, and and I think they're going to be aggressive with run blitzes to try and prevent that. So if you're able to overcome that and punch back and hit that 150 plus mark, you're really breaking their back, I think. Uh, so let's see how this unfolds, but interesting as always. Yep, uh, West Virginia pit 7.30 on ABC. One final thank you to Fortis for Root Performance Financial Security Guaranteed. Make sure to visit fortis.us.com. And Jed, as always, to we ask you to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WV football podcast, In the Gun. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet on YouTube, you can check out the West Virginia Pit Preview with Jed Owen and Wes. Uh, we obviously have here with Phil Steele. We'll be back uh, kicking things off with uh, Big Daddy on Tuesday next week, previewing Texas Tech and probably recapping a little bit of this backyard brawl. So a lot of fun stuff coming up for you. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, give us a like, and follow us on Twitter as well, at In The Gun Podcast. So for Judd Drenning, I'm Scott Callahan. We'll see you guys here soon. Take care.